For the past few Sundays, I've been speaking about the Lord's Prayer. The words behind me on the banner say, the prayer of a lifetime. And it's truly the greatest prayer that you'll ever pray. The prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. And we're coming to the final part of this prayer as it ends with a praise. And the same fly that's been buzzing around the stage has just come to distract me. Just like all the distractions of life, may that little fly that just flew by me represent all those annoying distractions of life that come at us from all the different ways that they come at us. The sound that that fly just made reminded me of what it's like to try to move a beehive. Has anybody ever tried to move a beehive, a wild beehive? I tried that this week. <laughs> Behind the barn, up uh, on the other side of the church property, we have a, a, a beehive that made its way inside of a cornhole game. Do you know what the cornhole games look like? They got those big things and a hole right in the middle. The bees looked at it and thought it was perfect. So they flew down in there and made a hive. I got the idea that instead of destroying the hive or killing the bees, I would put a strap around the bottom of the cornhole game and drag it over where, where, you know, where it needed to be. The strap needed to be longer. And one of those bees that's tasked with protecting the hive decided to land in my hair and proceeded to crawl through my scalp looking for something to stop whatever was going on at his hive, not happy. So there are distractions in life, aren't there? There are things that, I mean, you've had, how many of you had a bee in your hair this week? You ever heard the expression, you got a bee in your bonnet? Yeah, well, all of us are dealing with the distractions of life and that's why this prayer is so important and specifically this line of this prayer is so important. Because it reminds us who's in charge and who the universe belongs to. Not just this earth, not just all the things that we think are important about what's going on here, but literally the universe. And the part of this prayer that we are at as we begin this praise, we've been talking about Lead us not into temptation. Save us from ourselves, Lord. Deliver us from evil. And then this praise begins. And the praise begins like this. For thine is the kingdom. And I want to use those words, thine and yours, interchangeably today. To say, for yours is the kingdom. What does it mean to recognize that God's in charge of the kingdom? What is the kingdom? What does that even mean? What does that look like? And the kingdom is the universe that God has created. And the reason why it's so important for us to think about the fact that God's in charge is because we have a lot of distractions. We live in the kingdom of God, but sometimes we forget with the things buzzing around that distract us. And so as we begin to come to this concept of what it means to live in God's kingdom, there's a couple things that we should be thinking about as we live our lives this week. As you go through your life this week, I want you to think about a couple things. The first thing I want you to remember as you think about this part of the prayer is that we live in a world where there are kingdoms at war. If you look around the world today, in almost every area, every continent of the world, there's some kind of warfare going on. In our country, it's the information wars. 
Who's going to define the truth about who we are? Who's going to define what we believe? What is our country going to say is absolutely true? And we are at war for the truth of who we are. And that war is being fought today, this morning, from the pulpits all across America, from the media outlets all across America. Today we are looking and going back and forth in a constant struggle for the heart and soul of our humanity. Who's going to define us? What's that going to look like? Are we, going to be, are we going to be defined as a country by love of God and love of neighbor in the best of what those words mean? Are we going to be defined by secular, secular humanism or rationalism or atheism? All the isms that come into conflict with the word of God and what the word of God says about who we are. I'm going to hold up to you the Bible and say the Bible is the truth about what God says. I'm going to hold the Bible up to you and say this is the word of God. I'm going to hold the Bible up to you and say this is the truth of who God wants us to be because it's his kingdom. It's his universe. It's his world. This is my father's world, not mine. It's his kingdom, not mine. But there's a struggle and a battle going on. And there's different shades of the battle. There's different places that we're fighting this battle. There's lots of gray areas where we're fighting this battle. But the struggle that we're dealing with is the kingdom of God, all that is good about who we are, and the kingdom of darkness that would destroy us and beat us down and bring us down. It's the eternal battle between good and evil, and we're in the middle of that war. You say, well, I haven't uh, shot anybody this week. <laughs> well, good for you. We'll put a gold star by your name. But just recently in Austin, Texas, somebody came in and shot 13 people. That's happening. And it's happening more and more and more and more. And I don't know about you, but I look at that and I go, how can this be? How can we do this? What is going on in our world that this is happening? And we look around the world and what's happening in all the different places. The country of Yemen is on the brink of total collapse. The kingdom of Saudi Arabia is fighting a proxy war in Yemen. We don't hear about it. But it's mass starvation and hunger on a nationwide scale of a country that is being destroyed by the outside political forces that are coming in and destroying the very fabric of that country. That's just one country. I could give you dozens of examples all around the world. And we look at that and we say, you know, some people would say, I wouldn't say this, but some people would say, if God's in charge, he needs to do a better job. If, God's in, if this is his kingdom, then what in the world? How could this be? You watching online might be thinking the same thing. If this is God's kingdom, how in the world is his kingdom ever going to succeed? I ask myself the same question. It's a good question. It's an honest question. And so I stood back from that question one day and I said to myself, what makes love possible? And the conclusion that I came to is what makes love possible is the ability for us to choose to love. 
without any, any outside influences or manipulation, the ability <coughs> to choose to love is at the heart of the ability to love. I cannot love you, truly love you, unless I can choose to love you of my own free will. And so I stood back from that and I said, well, if that's true, then I also have to have the ability to choose not to love you. That there can be a choice that I make where I say, no, I'm not going to love you. Because without that, I couldn't have the choice to love you. And I thought about all the things that happen where people don't love each other and they hurt each other. That's part of the price of love. And so as I stood back and I looked at the whole thing, I said, what evil really is at the heart of all the chaos it creates is the price of love. Evil is the price of love. Because it's the consequence of what happens when we as imperfect human beings are given the ability to choose. It's not God's fault for what's going on in Yemen. It's the people that are there that are making the choices not to love, to hurt each other. The information wars that are going on in our country, the struggle that's going on between how we define ourselves, really comes down to how we're going to love each other and whether or not we're going to live in God's kingdom or we're going to live in the kingdom of this world that is striving to tear down everything that is good about who we are. And all these different ways that we fight this battle and all the different compromises that we make in our own lives are part of that struggle. And we need to re be reminded that there is another kingdom at war with God's kingdom. And we're part of that struggle. We're part of that battle this morning. And the struggle is real. It's, it's, not just, it's not just something we make up. The forces of darkness are arrayed against the forces of light. And I walk amongst you as a soldier of the light this morning. I walk with you as children of the light this morning and say, God, help us to be reminded of how important it is for us to be an example of what is good to the people around us. That's why we pray this sentence. God, it's your kingdom. Even in spite of all the problems, even in spite of all the circumstances, even in spite of all the darkness of this world, God, it's your kingdom. And we're going to remind ourselves of that even when we can't make sense out of what's going on. Even when we don't understand the reasons why things are happening the way that they are. Even if we look at some of the things that are imperfect and wrong about this world and say, how can God allow this? We have to be reminded that it's God's kingdom. And then we pray this sentence because we know that ultimately God is the keeper and author of everything. <laughs> I didn't come up with this world he did. I didn't come up with this system. He did. I didn't come up with this ability to choose. He did. That doesn't make it his fault. That just makes him a part of me doing the things that I need to do and living the way I need to live and giving me the power and the strength to live in such a way that I can please him and do the good things he's created me to do. Did you know you were hardwired to do good? You were. From the moment God created you, he didn't create you to be evil. He created you to be good. From the moment God authored creation, he stepped back and said, it is good. God said that about you and about me and about everything else that would happen in the future of the universe. He knew it all, and he said it's good. God didn't say, oh, I'll do better next time. <laughs> oh, really blew it there. I don't know. <laughs> no. God hired, hardwired you. Your base programming. At the center of who you are is the image of God. The very expression of who he is to this universe. And he created you to be eternal and to live eternally. 
not just for a brief moment of time as the breath passes over the world, but for eternity he created you to be a part of his world. He's the author and the keeper of everything. He knows where you're at. He knows what you're struggling with. He knows what you're going through. And the scripture tells us over and over and over and over again. And it says it like this. His perfect presence will keep you when you keep your mind focused on him. And when we focus on the fact that God's in charge and that it's his kingdom, that means we know and have confidence that as we live the way he's called us to live, he's going to be there and he's going to give us the power and the strength that we so desperately need. Because we're reminded as we pray this sentence that God is still on the throne. Now, when I say that, I'm, 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 I'm speaking to you from a scriptural worldview of the picture that John gives us in Revelation, the last book of the Bible, of God on the throne of heaven. And the picture that he paints for us is a great, vast area that looks like a sea of glass. And in the middle of that vast area, beyond comprehension, there is a throne. And on the center of that throne, as it's, as it's there on that great sea of glass, it's raised up just a little bit over that whole sea of glass and overlooks that entire sea of glass. As you walk up those steps to that throne, at the center of the throne, there is a supernatural light that appears to be almost like an emerald green color. And within that presence of light that is so powerful that you can't even look at it is the eternal presence of God. That's how he describes it. It's not human form. It's a spiritual being and a spiritual presence in that word picture that gives us the concept and the idea of limitless power. And so in my mind, when I think about God being on the throne of the universe, my mind goes to that description that John gives us in Revelation. And I see in my mind that great sea of glass. Just imagine a huge, vast expanse of, of glass floor. Almost translucent. And in the middle of that great sea of glass is this throne, and in the middle of that throne is this visible presence of limitless power that shines almost in a green hue across that great sea of glass. That's the picture in my mind when I say, and God is still on the throne. All the pieces of the parts of life of who we are and all the little stuff we're dealing with like flat tires and kids that won't stop crying or whatever else is going on in our lives seem to fade away in the light of that vision of who God is and the fact that he's still in charge of this world. We pray this sentence to remind us of that. And then we pray this sentence in a, in a way that says, God, not only are you still on the throne, but I trust you with it. <laughs> As if that was ours to say anyway. <laughs> but I trust you with it. I trust you with my life. I trust you with the stuff I'm dealing with. I trust you with what I'm going through. I know you're going to help me. I know you're going to be there for me. July 4th is just around the corner. And July 4th is when the wheat farmers in northern Colorado begin to harvest their wheat. About that first week of July, the wheat comes to a place where it can be harvested. And those great combines go across those plains and begin to harvest that wheat. I've been taking our congregation on a journey through the life of a wheat farmer. 
<laughs> and so last year, my friend in Colorado who farms 3,000 acres of wheat had a catastrophic hailstorm come through his farm and completely flattened his crop. The harvest that he'd been working on all year completely destroyed. I had him send me a picture of it. This is what his field looked like after the hail came through. Absolutely nothing to harvest. I asked him to send me, I asked him to go out into his completely ruined fields. And I said, if, if you could just get me a hundred seeds. And so he said, I went down and I got on my hands and knees on one of the best portions of my field that I could find anything. And as I got down on my hands and knees, I scrabbled around in the dirt and in the stalks that were there and found a hundred seeds. He sent me those hundred seeds. And we, last September, sent him some of those seeds back to plant for this year. This is what his field looks like as of this week. Thousands of acres of the most beautiful wheat you'll ever see. And he took the picture where he planted the seeds that we sent him. And in just a few short weeks, if everything goes the way it's supposed to, and I looked up the weather report for northeastern Colorado, and it's supposed to be in the 80s and 90s this all next week, which is beautiful for the wheat because it dries it out and makes it ready to harvest. And I am on this journey with you of life. And there are some years when everything we try to do seems to be completely flattened. Everything we try to do doesn't work. Everything we try to do just bites us back. We work as hard as we've ever worked for less than we've ever received for anything we've ever done. In the good years, when it looks like this, it's still God's kingdom, and we trust him with it. In the bad years, like last year, when the crop is completely flattened and we can't find anything, it's still his kingdom. What do we care more about sometimes than anything else? It's the future. Our children. The things that we look forward to and love is the legacy of our futures and what that's going to look like. This struggle between good and evil is not just a struggle for this generation, but it's a struggle for every generation. So I had him send me a picture of his children standing in that field. We've obviously blurred their faces a little bit, but as his children stand out there in that field that he planted, he's saying to his heavenly Father, just like we are, God, this is your kingdom. This is your harvest. This is your world. In a few short weeks, we're going to celebrate with him I told him, I said, when, I, when he sent me these pictures, I said, in the combine, in the combine, that's when we'll celebrate. <laughs> and so I wrote him this poem this week. And I've called the poem, The Harvest Safely Home. And I want you to apply this to your own life this morning. I want you to think about where you're at, what you may be going through, what you may be struggling with, what you may be looking at. And I want you to hear these words. Storms and rain will come and go. Falls, hard frost will give way to snow. Spring's first dawn will bring summer's glow and the promise of another harvest safely home. We work, we toil, the process is slow. The efforts we give Results we don't know. We wonder and wait with silos of stone for the promise of another harvest safely home. Things we don't do, places we don't go, the never-ceasing winds of life, the wine of their blow, 
We wait in time, and in the time it takes nature to show the promise of another harvest safely home. At the end of the day, when our spirits are low, the setting sun will catch the sentinels of wheat in their beautiful rows. We'll look to the stars in milky ways flow and pray another harvest safely home. The day draws near and finally has come when that which is most precious of what life is from brings its promise of a future in a time not long of another harvest safely home. So to borrow from an old song, sung soft and slow, come, you thankful people, come. Raise the song of harvest home. All is safely gathered in ere the winter storms begin. God, our maker, does provide for our wants to be supplied. Come to God's own temple, come, and raise the song of harvest home. Every one of you today is planting into the, into the soil of your life the seeds of your future and the promise of what God can do in your life as you live for him. Remember with me this week that this is his kingdom. That he's still on the throne. That he's still hearing and answering prayer. And the cycles of life and all the things that we go through are understood by him because he is the author and the keeper of everything that we are. And he's going to see us through. He's bigger than the problems. He's bigger than the situations. He's bigger than the circumstances. He's bigger than the fears. He's bigger than all the things we can come against. Why? Because he's the way maker. He's the promise keeper. That's who he is. And I want us to sing that chorus. And I'd like for Tyler, if he would, to come back right now as we sing the song of victory this morning. It's his kingdom. It's his power. And it's his glory forever. And I want you to celebrate that with me this week, to celebrate the victory of what it means for God to be in charge of his kingdom this morning. Let's sing it together. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. There may be some of you this morning that would like 
to make an altar right here in front of our church or sit over here on the sides. There may be some of you here that just say, you know, Pastor Matt, I just need to be reminded that this is God's kingdom and I'm gonna trust him with whatever I'm going through right now. Whatever I'm dealing with, God, I'm giving it to you. And if you want that this morning, I'd like to close this service with a time of prayer. You come forward, those of you that like to, and if, and if, and if you wanna stay where you're at and make an altar where you're at, that's fine too. But if you just wanna make a public profession of faith that God, you're in charge of this, I want you to come right now and I wanna pray with you right now as we close our service. So if you wanna come, as he sings this chorus, you just come and we'll just pray as we close our service today. You come right now. You are here touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you, and you are here, turning lives around. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, mending every heart. I worship you, I worship you. You are a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Those of you that are here at the altar and those of you that are here in the sanctuary, we just make an altar right where you are, where you are right now. And let's just pray together and ask God's presence to be on our lives for his anointing to be over us this morning. Heavenly Father, you see each person here in this sanctuary today. We've lifted your praise to you today. Lord, I know that a lot of us have been through some difficult times. We feel like Elijah out there in that cave. Lord, we're the only one left and nobody cares. Lord, you come to us and you speak to us, not in the mighty winds or the earthquakes, but Lord, you speak to us in a still, small voice. The words of Jesus come echoing down through the centuries as they instruct us to pray, yours is the kingdom this morning, God. So for whatever those that are praying here at the altar are praying about, Lord, you know all about it. Comfort them, strengthen them, encourage them, heal them. Bring healing to the situation that they may be praying for, Lord, whatever it may be, God. Give us the grace and the strength to trust you with this world and this place we live. And Lord, for those that are sitting here in this sanctuary and for all the things that may be going on in their lives, Lord, we're thankful you brought us through. We're asking, Lord, that you would be with us and help us and encourage us and strengthen us Put a smile on our face for the harvest of the future that we plant with the seeds of righteousness today. And God, I pray that you would bless our community, bless Vista and this North County area, bless our country and our world. And Lord, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem this morning. We ask your blessing over all the reasons why we fight each other, a blessing that comes from an understanding of the price of love. And Lord, I pray that you would help us individually we can't change the world, but we can change where we're at. Help us each one to do our best where we're at, Lord, to change the world and make it a better place. For those of you that can quote the Lord's Prayer with me and even those watching online, I'd like to close this service with the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray as our benediction prayer today. Would you pray it with me, those of you that know it? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.